Namaste, this is GP Rao. We are so happy to see friends from all over the country, from Malaysia, from Thailand, from UK. So this is an interesting uh, program. Uh, while the whole universe is struggling, all of us are in pain and anguish. But as leaders, we have a responsibility to accept the reality, move forward and take people along. So we thought of a unique program where we'll try to integrate the insights and instincts from the science and spirituality. That's how we approached Sri Anish, a spiritual teacher, and Mr. Padmakar, a, an accomplished, outstanding professional, the chairman and managing director of BPCL, and a leadership uh, teacher, a professor, Dr. Asha Bandarkar. So they will take us through a wonderful session today for building uh, resilience. So now I will have the pleasure of introducing our three facilitators or the resource persons. I'll start with uh, Sri Anish. Okay. Oh, you want to show the housekeeping guidelines? IT, please show, show. No problem. He wants everybody to mute their mic, uh, use the chat box. And uh, when you want to type a question, start with a capital Q because sometimes you give a greeting, you participate in a chat show. Uh, when you ask a question, start with a capital Q. And he also says organizers can remove a participant who appear to be unsafe. I don't know what does it mean by appear. We'll leave it to the IT. Thank you so much. We'll come to the introductions. Okay. So let me have the pleasure of introducing uh, Sri Anish. Uh, he's an MBA, uh, ex-corporate executive and entrepreneur, was part of high-tech and consulting industry. Some of you would know that he was a part of Brahmam Solutions, he was part of Vidya, he was, he was one of the founding members of People Strong. But then he decided uh, 15 years ago and moved to Malaysia. But quite early in his career, he was guided to move to Himalayas and explore the other side of life, spirituality. And now it is, we are making both sides together. Over a decade of intense sadhana brought many realizations and transformations in his life. A simple and profound being, Anish, he is a spiritual teacher, mentor, and a guide to many. Not only in India, abroad, he has an office in London. He goes, teaches, talks to people in conversation with in many parts of the world. His vision is to spread light, the light of inner wisdom, to make this world more beautiful and more awakened. His work involves public talks, spiritual mentoring, he writes well, poetry, he's a poet, meditation retreats, walks up seva and community, and he also leads Sadho Sangha, is a community of like-minded people who want to spread this light. Okay, thank you Anish for joining and agreeing to lead today's discussion. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next speaker that is Mr. Padmakar. Uh, he is a master's in PMI artist, but prior to that, he was a science, uh, agriculture graduate. You, know, you can see that farming, farming. And he's a SAP HR certified, process uh, uh, certified uh, from Asta Foundation, long service, uh, one company, uh, one temple of uh, professional work. He's in BPCL, involved in several initiatives, including HR technology finalized several path-breaking agreements with Collective. He's on the board of PPCL and several other subsidiary companies and other companies. He's a painter and in exhibition space for the last eight years. He reads a lot across the 10 years. Photography are his other serious passions. passions. So welcome, Padmakar. So thank you for joining Anish today. We'll move on to Asha Bandarkar. So she's... Yeah, so one of the simplest uh, profiles he writes uh, is a psychologist by training. Most people in the industry and the academics know he is now currently with IMI. He is a professor of organizational behavior. Earlier, he was with MDI, IM Lucknow. She's a coach and mentor by vocation. And she's a passionate advocate of women leaders. Uh, but then she always calls me for the women's program. Uh, 
Uh, she's a wandering soul by nature, would like to take time to smell the flowers. She has written several articles, uh, 40 plus articles, nine plus books, and her next book is in the office. So thank you, Asha. Thank you for joining Anish and Padma today. Thanks so much. With those introductions, <clears throat> I will uh, pass on the baton to Sri Anish. Uh, he will take us through a conversation with the, uh, both these uh, co-panelists. Then he will come to the audience to take up your questions, your perspectives, your insights, and a conversation. That's what we'll do. First, let the conversation start amongst three of them. Over to Sri Anish. Namaste and thank you once again, GP, for, for all the help and support. I'll start with a mantra. Om Astuma Sadgamaya Tam Suma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityurmar Amrit Gamaya Om Om It is a deep pleasure to be able to share some of my thoughts with such an illuminaries, with such august audience today. I know some of you personally, we've, we've been in touch um, 15 years ago when I was still part of the corporate world. It is such an honor also at the same time to have this conversation with these two great friends, Padmakar and Ashaji. It is such a blessing to be able to share some thoughts and have a discussion with all of you. So once again, welcome everybody. When GP asked the question about some of the challenges that we are experiencing today, about the current situation that we all are in, which is impacting almost all of us directly, few of us indirectly also. When I read the one word that most of us wrote in the chat, the word which came to me when GP asked this question was a transition. From this side of the world, when I'm seeing all of this change, it appears to me that we are passing through a great human transition, transition of human consciousness. And every transition goes through a process of suffering, pain, agony, grief, uncertainty, fear, all the adjectives that we wrote in the chat. But this is essentially a big, huge transition from which humanity is going through. I think the world will see a world before this event and after this event. So pandemic is, I think, one carrier of that, of this whole humongous transition which, which is coming. Like in corporate, in businesses, whenever there is a transition, you know, from the old technology move, move to the new systems, from the old paradigm ways of working, we move to the new paradigm ways of working. You know, a lot of us feel uncertainty, fear. This is a similar situation, but now it's happening at the human scale. Yeah. That's about the transition, but this is what the law of life is. This is what the law of nature is, that any transition will go through a creative destruction. And I call it a creative destruction because here, unfortunately, even lives are getting destroyed. Families are also suffering. But it's still a creative destruction because this is a great push for human consciousness to move to the next level of awareness. And that is what we thought we'll talk about it. But whenever something like this happens around us, you know, it does something to our body-mind. We are looking at the news, the media, the information that's coming to us. We are experiencing what is happening to our loved ones. It does something tra tragic to our body-mind. Our hormonal system gets disturbed, you know. Uh, the cortisol levels increases in the body. The mind gets totally confused, fogged. The decision-making gets impacted, our stability gets impacted, unless we start to build the real resilience. We want to talk about that in, in today's talk. When GP and I were talking about this, we looked at the leadership. You know, in this situation, whenever something is happening, we're always looking at the leadership of the country to help, support, wade us through this. So hence, the leadership at all level is extremely important right now. If the if the country or if a society needs to move to the next level of consciousness, awareness, stability, it's the job of the leaders. Because leaders can create a 
immense impact through their thoughts, through their words, through their actions. They also, in the business corporate world scenario, they have the responsibility of employees' health, their happiness, their long-term well-being. And just becoming outwardly positive in situations like these does not work. So if I talk you know, superficially positive as a leader, people are perceptive, people are intelligent, they see through, they feel that I'm just trying to portray a positive outlook, but inside I'm also equally shattered and, and in deep agony, fear and uncertainty. So that in such intense situation, that behavior doesn't really work. What works is when I go deep down in my own being and start to build the real resilience there. And leaders in such situations, because as I said, the mind gets fogged, body's immunity gets compromised because of the negativity and we'll talk about it briefly. It becomes almost impossible to, you know, hold the grand vision, to see beyond because we become very, you know, we're paranoid about the situation and leaders need to have an expanded vision all through, no matter what's going on. And India is a civilization. We are a civilization which is rooted in the wisdom, not in the belief system. And when I say we are a civilization rooted in the wisdom, that is the reason for many centuries in the past, the whole world looked up to India for resilience. We showed the world what resilience is and that is what is needed today once again to regain that back into our life. And that's when we thought about building this program. I'm reminded of a beautiful statement with a great scientist made, theoretical physicist, Albert Einstein. I want to open this session today with that statement which Einstein made and he said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. Let me repeat. He says, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it in the first place. With this statement, I invite my two dear friends, Padmakar ji and Asha ji, to share their views on this statement and we'll lead it from there. Padmakar, would you like to share some of your thoughts on this statement? Sure, sure. Uh, Anish, on the face of it, I don't know where you got this uh, statement by Albert Einstein. On the face of it, it looks very, very simple. Mm. Uh, but actually what he means is that there appear to be many, many levels of consciousness. Mm. So there are certain, at some level, some problem is getting created. So unless you are able to traverse through all these levels of consciousness and then look at it together, you will not know from where you need to really uh, bring out a solution or any method to handle it. It's, it's a very beautiful statement. Uh, it seems to be appear to be on the other hand, it also gives me another meaning that there is something from the nature. If I have to apply it today in terms of the ongoing issues, which the world is facing, our country is facing so profoundly, there is something because if I look at the germ, uh, the coronavirus, that itself is a consciousness of a very different kind. And uh, it's an organism which is also trying to thrive and then creating mayhem. And to it, it's not a mayhem. To it, to it it's a very species-specific kind of consciousness. Its own job is to multiply and then mutate. And to us, it is trouble. So if I'm at the other end of consciousness and there is a science which is dealing with it up to the point, but uh, mm -hmm. that also cannot really negate the effects of, effects of what this corona consciousness is doing from the organism. I think somewhere we need to get into the other methods by plunging deeper into our conscious layers to see what is it that I need to do in terms of dealing with this and also adding on what you said about being on the cusp of transformation of some kind. Uh, it, it seems that the the human beings in a ecology of certain kind has sent certain pulse waves to the outer ecology which seems to be responding in certain ways. So how is it we need to balance it out? I think 
the the challenge to me from this statement therefore is manifold and the key to it is in terms of not panicking in terms of plunging deeper into ourselves to see where the solution lies and how is it i am going to deal with it yeah beautifully expressed padmakar ji beautifully expressed asha would you like to share some of your thoughts on this statement thank you um nice quote quite profound and i liked what uh, padmakar ji's uh, interpretation of it um you know it's so fantastic when uh, minds interact because now um i'm coming out with another perspective on this and each one of us comes from some space so um levels of consciousness i was trying to understand from the view of leadership and uh, one thing which comes to mind is that the corporate sector dominantly operates in the materialistic space if that is a level of consciousness not able to see why atul shivastava says not able to see people when they are speaking can the host please change the spotlight whatever may i continue yes, yes please yes. yes so um the dichotomous uh, entities are materialistic versus the spiritualistic and uh, the mat- uh, materialistic part would be that uh, we are focused on the profits we are focused on the tangible we are focused on the result and that's how we interpret that does not negate is that better am i visible this is in response to what somebody said yes you visible, visible now on the yeah, main screen asha yes. yes thank you yeah so i'll just continue my thought um but being in the material space does not mean that you are completely avoid you know away from the spiritual space and uh, but it is typically ignored or underplayed now here is a situation here is a context in which there is an Im- immense need and requirement for us to shift our level of conf- uh, consciousness not to ignore the materialistic but to include the spiritualistic mm. and uh, the importance of uh, including the spiritualistic comes from the fact of what is known as collective consciousness at some level this is what uh, you know um everyone says that if i feel isolated if i feel individual if i feel unique you know and uh, if i look at myself as an entity separate from everybody else the way i deal with the world is very different but our uh, um, you know traditions our uh, knowledge of uh, philosophy and our collective heritage teaches us which science is now discovering that we are all connected where are we connected we are all connected at the spiritual level and therefore it is that when somebody hurts we also hurt and that is why there is this situation where today we are all suffering even though individually we may not suffer but mm. collectively as a race collectively as a people collectively as societies we are suffering so i think those are my initial thoughts uh, in response to einstein statement uh, regarding uh, you know you can't uh, solve a problem from the level at which level of consciousness at which it has started beautiful asha beautiful you've kind of opened a grand you know pandora of of we being all the same the the inherent uh, thread of connectedness oneness yeah beautiful asha ji beautiful there's another way to quickly look into this statement just in one line you know when he says that we can't solve the problem from the same level of consciousness then it means that we need to upgrade our consciousness take it to a higher level to be able to solve a problem which got created by the lower level of consciousness so we need to all upgrade our consciousness now einstein is a scientist and he is using the word consciousness as not information 
I think that's a very interesting point I felt here. He is saying that by access of information, you will not be able to solve the problem. But by evolving the consciousness, upgrading the consciousness, something can be done. So he is talking about something phenomenal, something much more bigger here, you know, even being a scientist. So that comes to the, through the second element of this, that which then also means that we need to look at science and spirituality in a very different light. If I, if I, if I talk on that a bit, you know, science, okay, let's from, start from spirituality. Spirituality is the science of the inner. And science is the manifestation of spirituality outside. You see, let me repeat. Spirituality is the science of the inner, and science is the manifestation of spirituality outside. So, which then means these are not two different things. They are deeply connected. There is a beautiful Hindi word called Pramana. English translation is proof. Science's basis is proof. So is the basis of spirituality. Spirituality is not a belief system. Spirituality also thrives on the proof. In the case of science, the proof is outward, which means through the five senses, through the five senses, I can look at, feel, touch the proof. The proof of spirituality is an inner experience, which is beyond the five sense perception. Though you use the five sense perception to perceive it, but the experience is very different. Experience happens at a very interior level. Let's take a quick example of, let's say, something like love or compassion. You know, I can't dissect myself from a scientific perspective to pinpoint, okay, where, where is love? I can't find it. Yeah, or where is prayerfulness? I can't find it. Yeah, but it's a deep feeling that we all feel experience. Yeah, so it is something of the inner and situations like these tell us that probably we've gone too far and are only relying on the scientific laws. Maybe we are forgetting the laws of spirituality. As I said, they are both interconnected. Maybe it's time when we need to look at it very carefully. Let me give you another example. You know, when I was a child, I was growing up in India. Whenever, you know, you would have a sore throat or something, your parents would take you to the doctors. Doctor will say, hey, you have tonsils. They're swollen. Okay, what needs to be done? Take tonsils out because they have no function in human body. That was the science at that time. Left, right and center, they were operating people to take tonsils out. Well, in nature, nothing is created without any reason. Nature is supremely intelligent. Nature is the epitome of consciousness. If it is created something, there must be a reason, purpose of it. Bingo, we found out later, in fact, recently, that your tonsils are the first level of defense in human system. When I, when I eat something, when a virus or, some, or a bacteria goes in my mouth or through my nasal pathway, tonsils are the first level of defense. They attack the virus or a bacteria or an external infection there and then to stop it to get into the system. Something similar happened with appendix. The science at that time thought appendix is of no use. You have a pain, remove it. Well, again, nature does not create anything as a waste as a unnecessity. If it is created something, there must be a reason. Let's look at it. Science started looking at that. And science said, oh, all the gut bacteria which are important for our, our well-being, our digestion, appendix is a storehouse of that. It's a backup. So if somebody's got a bad stomach or has taken a bag, uh, bug and the entire system is flushing it out uh, through diarrhea, our entire gut microbes, the gut good bacteria is washed out of the system. How does body build that again? Bingo! You go to the um, appendix and those, those good gut bacteria which are stored as a backup in the, in the appendix, they start to come in the gut, start to multiply, human body becomes well again. Yeah. Science dissects everything to know the reality or try to know the reality. Spirituality encompasses everything to know the nature of reality. Both are trying to know the or find out the nature of reality, 
paths are very different one path is dissect 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 divide 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 cut 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 the other path is unite as asha ji said uh, that it's about oneness it's about connectivity it's about it's about this thread spirituality talks about that it looks at the whole thing from that angle you know let me give you a very quick example few years ago i mean almost over a decade and a half ago when i first moved to the himalayas here i was very fascinated with the nature plants i went to an area which is famous for apple orchards to increase the production they were spraying on the apple fruits left right and center in just a year they found out now there are no bees all bees are dead they had to import bees from other areas whenever there was a flowering season on the apple they killed the bees because they thought to protect the pest attack let's spray they didn't look at the whole bigger picture the bigger picture was when you kill the pest the bee also gets killed the bee gets killed there is nothing happening then yeah the entire process shuts down you can't grow food if there is no bee yeah so one looks at in a very exclusive manner science spirituality looks at everything in a very inclusive manner that's that's one of the key difference and just to touch upon another interesting point here to experience all of this the world the i am is needed the when i am needed the world exists when i am not there the world does not exist in my experience right this i am that experiences the whole world is the gist of spirituality and we'll we'll decode it we'll open it open it in a bit yeah having said that having having said about the connection or this deep integration between science and spirituality which is probably much more needed today because only at the level of science we might not be able to solve this problem we need to look at the angle or the vastness of spirituality now to build deep resilience to be able to wade through yeah padmakar ji aisha ji i want to i would love to hear your thoughts on this yeah this time aisha ji would you go first yeah thank okay. you uh the first thought uh, which comes to mind is where it all started you know this entire so called scientific method which the west has embraced and that was rene descartes who uh argued that the world was like a machine and that its pieces like clockwork mechanisms and that the machine could be understood by taking apart its pieces studying them then putting them back together mm. the point is that both cannot be done at the same time having the holistic perspective as well as the micro uh, you know perspective but the point is, uh, the the aspect is that both of them are two ways of looking at the world science has taken one path and it has helped in one way in many domains of knowledge for example science has helped uh, the entire uh, development of uh, medicine for example and a certain kind of you know treatments has all been because of this capacity to uh, decode by breaking down into bits and so called atomization mm. is the process there which has helped but now comes the point why does it matter to us as human beings our training is dominantly scientific in approach if we are engineers trained as engineers if we are trained in the sciences so there is an over development of one side of our brain that is the logical side of our brain or the so called uh, left brain and uh, inadequate focus or inadequate development of the right side of the brain which controls emotions and which controls spirituality so the very fact that both left and right both logic and emotion exist within each one of us means that each one of us has the capacity for both and yet each one of us focuses dominantly on one or the other so the spiritualist is in the himalayas and uh, the left brain guy is busy in the material world whereas we need both thank you anishji mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful huh? So when you say the spiritualist is in the Himalayas, I I hope you're not referring to me here. 
<laughs> okay see because i'm also very scientific in my approach you see i look at the world as a praman proof yeah so <laughs> anyway padmakar ji your views on this please uh actually if you look at ourselves i mean the way we are in our country i i think uh, somewhere over a period of time it was considered as not passe that uh, you need to believe in spirituality and then which is generally poured into a lot of religious practices so at a point in time everyone felt that they were not making any sense without looking at the deeper meaning uh because everything cannot be explained for everyone and some of these tend to be very mysterious and not meant to be given to those who don't understand so these are codified into some religious practices and then put there uh to which probably even today in the villages etc it goes on now but i think it is the more educated if i can call it uh the more educated you are the more complicated you seem to become and more truncated uh, because even in my company or many other places when i dealt with the labor employees who are least educated i find that they have no problem in encompassing everything they are able to move from spiritual to materialistic to rational to traditional and sentimental many things they are able to encompass and they are at peace and they're confident uh, but i think the higher we got educated so called western education which has taken us you seem to be looking the way the science is dissected or cut into several pieces our education system has also done it to us if i have studied physics it doesn't seem to have any connection with chemistry it you know it took me much much longer time as an adult for me to understand all these are integrated these are integral sciences of life of nature which for us to understand they have unified the or not unified they have broken it up into simple understandable pieces i think that is way the problem of the scientific approach lies we are looking at things unitarily without looking at things together and beyond that there is a stigma effect and what we are able to understand is the outside in through all your sensory mechanisms but you are not able to figure out what is inside out or what is it that i need to do once again in terms of restoring the balance part of it i think this is where the whole dichotomy lies even in terms of the way we run organizations today or institutions today we need to take things out of people for what i am giving you in terms of pecuniary resources and so on but some way the softer elements like the way asha ji has explained that i tend to be left brained and then it is the weakness for me to speak about the other sides of me the softer sides of me so therefore i tend to deal with you in a certain way uh, which is also the sociological coding of what masculine is all about which is strong i am a hercules i am an atlas i am carrying the whole weight of the world and i'm brave and i can do it but somewhere imbalance creeps in because the moment you are not because ultimately we are like Uh, we have to oscillate among three things uh, the axis of thought feeling and action continuous every thought of mine has to be checked with my feeling and then every feeling has to be cross checked am i being unnecessarily mushy all right what is it i do next i mean that is where i see the connection between the heart as well as the head and if i don't do this continuous interconnections between these two uh which is what to me spiritualism is all about in terms of not being excessively thought concentrated but also cross check not just feeling again the feeling for what and why am i feeling so and then can i go to the back of it the root of it which is once again a scientific temperament of a different kind on the outside let mm-hmm. uh but i think where we are completely lost in the whole process somewhere is trying to divide things into different pieces and trying to find a solution which unfortunately is not likely to come 
unless we put in several elements by dredging from inside issues like hope, resurgence, will. Uh, somewhere I was reading, watching the video sent by someone how bodies create antibodies. It's not just by this, but also the very pleasant uh, episodes as well as issues like love and affection and also experiencing human company, which means well for you. Several of these things also create antibodies in the system. Okay. Now, if this is what that is, why is it we are not looking at all these things? Uh, so I think this current situation paper has created many, many issues in terms of uh, being social right now and in terms of being kept aside, being isolated, saving myself from the disease, but that also seems to be not giving me the human companionship, uh, which is the sanmarga which I need to follow through satsang of a certain kind. I think all those kind of things are not happening, and which is once again coming from the world of spirituality in a certain way. Beautifully expressed, beautifully expressed, Padmakarji. I mean, this is. You've actually nailed it, you know, this is what is really needed. Because when we talk about resilience, it can't just happen through from the mental space. We need to explore another space of our being which we are overlooking. And this current situation, pandemic, you know, apart from all the, all the suffering it has brought on us as collective humanity, it is also waking us up. I mean, that's the reason we are having this, to me, it's a very important dialogue. It, it has woken us up to now take this dialogue in the middle of the corporate, in the middle of the business world and see that, you know, business is also not separate from life. Business is an unsure, a part of life. And the rules which are, which are good for life are the rules which must be good for the business also. It's like the, the business world is a subset of life. We can't have two separate set of rules here. And I think that's where We've been kind of going wrong and maybe the situation is trying to wake us up. That's the reason I look at it as a, as a time of great transition. Yeah. Let's look at virus. You know, the science is saying the virus is extremely resilient, it's mutating and, and the rest of it. We are, of course, much, uh, much bigger than a, than a virus, not just in terms of size, but the consciousness in the virus is little less than the consciousness in a human being. That's the reason we've put human being as the top of the manifested world. Yeah, the, the top of the life that it could achieve. Yeah. Now, if the virus is too resilient or becoming too resilient, I think we also need to become too resilient. Virus is be trying to become resilient only at the level of body, physicality, biology. But we are much more than body, physicality, biology. We need to, we need to become resilient at a much deeper level. It happens at two levels in my experience, you know. One is I would call the outward resilience, which I think we've achieved very well. The Almost overnight, the, the business world, the companies moved to work, work from home and, you know, establishment in technology so that the operations do not suffer. I think we achieved that. The outward resilience, to a great degree, we achieved that. We're talking in the business context or in a, in a industry context right now. We're not talking about, you know, let's say the context of migrant labor right now, yeah? So in that context, we've achieved resilience. But resilience is another element to it. It's the long-termness. You know, I play with the camera. I love the whole process of filmmaking also. I, I guide a, a bunch of people on creating good cinema, etc. Camera is a very interesting thing, you know, it, it, it has a, you change the lens and you can go microscopic you change the lens and you can have a vast panoramic view. Zoom in, zoom out. What the camera does, our human eye does much more quickly, you know, in a single split second, we can zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. Now, if the nature has given us this capability to the eye, there must be this capability in the whole system, which means we have the capacity to view a situation in a microscopic view and to deal with it quickly the immediate crisis, 
and at the same level be able to see the macro view. In my experience, this can be done simultaneously and this must be done simultaneously. Otherwise, what happens? Most of the people live their life managing or dealing from one crisis to another crisis. In between, there are periods of forgetfulness. Let me repeat again. In my experience, after meeting thousands of people of all status of society or from different backgrounds, I have viewed people have become very habitual of living their lives in three zones, largely. To handle an immediate crisis, once it's over, you forget about it, then you move on because another crisis comes in front of you. So crisis, crisis in between periods of forgetfulness. It happens largely because we are too microscopic all the time. And it strains our system. When you are too microscopic, it strains the system. We need to develop the capacity to alter the macro view at the same time. Yeah. And for a leader, it is absolutely must to be able to marry the both. And I'm saying at the same time. While I'm dealing with the micro, I am absolutely aware of the macro. Yeah. Now, now if that's if that's what it is, then we need to look at resilience from a different angle then. Padmakarji said a very beautiful thing about mind and heart. Friends, these are the two layers of human existence largely, although there are more layers, but just to simplify it. We operate our life from these two spheres, the sphere of head, the sphere of heart, largely I'm saying. If I ask a question, when do most of us feel most energized, most resilient, most stronger, most rooted? When do we feel that? The answer is, because I've posed this question to a lot of friends already, <laughs> the answer is whenever I'm surrounded by my loved ones, whenever I know there are people who are taking care of me, or who are not taking care of me, let's say who stand by me, the dearest of my friends, the beloveds of my family, the extended uh, social system, which is always supporting me, Whenever I'm in that feeling space, that knowing space, I feel very deeply rooted and resilient. It's a space of inclusiveness. But whenever I'm in a space of individual, I'm alone, I will do my own thing. I can lead my own life the way I want and so on and so forth. It's a very individualistic attitude. This cuts me from this support system. This is the way of the mind, the way of the ego, which has science cuts things down to pieces. Because we're largely operating in the, in the, from the space of mental intellectual zone, we are missing the deeper strength of establishment, the soil of our heart, where the deep roots of resilience must take, take shape. Huh? So, if I say, what is the heart, what is the seat of inclusiveness in a human being? The seat of inclusiveness in a human being is the heart space, which is a space of love, compassion, uh, you know, agreement and taking everybody together and so on. What is the seed of disconnection in the, in the human system is the mind. It creates a illusion or an ego to say you are not me, I am not you. And every time I have to only be focused on my own self-interest. Bingo, the problem starts. Look at our, our whole training, you know, since the time we were, we were in school, to college, to competitive exams and so on and so forth. We've just been training the, this center of human existence, the mind. Have we done anything to train the heart? Have we done anything? Have we gone to any, have we created any programs to, to train me on compassion? To train me about, about, you know, feeling this oneness. That is what we are calling spirituality. Yeah. That is kind of, I think, we've missed that. As the humanity, as the culture, as the industrial revolution happened, we evolved materialistically. We forgot completely about the heart space. I have some interesting data to share with you on this. But let me first hear what Padmakarji and Ashaji has to say on this. Then I'll share some very interesting data on this, on this mind and heart coherent system. Yeah, please, Asha, would you, would you, just your comments, just your comments about have we really focused too much on the on the on building the mind space rather than the heart space and why we've not focused on the heart training? 
think I made this point a little earlier, but I shall do mm. that. It's our education system mm. which dominantly overdoing this whole left brain business, mm. which is why um, we are pretty stunted on the emotional part. Mm. And that is where uh, just as you train your uh, mind, you also need to train your uh, heart system. Mm. Just as you need uh, train your thoughts, yeah, that's the way you also need to train your emotions. And one domain of work which has come up in the last 20 years is emotional intelligence, where it is talking about trying to integrate the emotional with the thought part of it, except that um, it does not touch upon the spirituality, which mm -hmm. at the center of uh, being uh, emotionally intelligent. And maybe that is where we need to do more work. Thank you. Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely, Asha. But Margaret, would you want to share some of your thoughts on this? Uh, I think uh, when I was thinking through, I was sure that uh, we are not letting go of the heart center in any which way. But we seem to be using it only from an uh, eye point of view in terms of an egocentricity point of view, uh, which is about instant gratification for self. Uh, and so, therefore, there is a, as science is advanced, it seems to have put forward many materialistic comforts and some things which are desirable. Uh, so, therefore, we have never been happy and then we have been adding on one gizmo after the other, which seems to be making us happy in a certain way. But at an eye point of view, at an egotistic point of view, and not at the inclusive level of others. And, and I think the second thing which has happened to us socially is uh, as we are raping the Western culture in terms of their own individuality, um, whereas as an Asian country, we always believed in community living and everything was community-based, joint family systems. As we moved away and adopted more of the our, our wrong understanding of the Western psyche or thing is that I need to be individualistic. Everything is about me and there is no space for others. Mm. So the heart center seems to be full, fully filled with the I part of me and with instant gratifications. Somewhere we have ex excluded the spaces for many others whom I can certainly include. And I think it is wrong for me to love the general humanity. Not many seem to be doing that. Uh, so it seems to be this is a culture which is prevalent and then which is also encouraged and nurtured. And even in the workspaces too, it is all about the rat race. And therefore, if I share something with my co-workers, will I be beaten down and will this other person get the coveted progression, whatever it is, or a bonus? So we seem to be creating all these things all the time. So while I understand uh, that the deeply worked for and earned things could belong to me, the power of sharing, the power of uh, love, the power of affection, a whole lot of these seem to be reserved for the self space, not so much for many others. And probably I make space if I'm married, yeah, maybe I'll make space for my wife and children to that point. Mm. But it doesn't seem to include many others too. I think this also is where the problem lies in terms of, you know, shutting the doors for many other opportunities coming your way where love is willing to come inside and you're shutting the doors. And you also shut the door in terms of not taking many of the offerings you can give to others. But this is how I think mm. it. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for the market. Thank you. Okay. Few quick things on this before we move ahead is that, you know, in the, in the Eastern system, in the Indian system, we said everything is nada. Nada is sound. Everything emerged from the sound. And we said everything is about frequency and vibration here. Yeah. So heart and head also have a frequency. The, some of the, some of the, Attributes of the mind are, let's say, the sense of fear, the sense of anxiety, the sense of grief, the sense of uncertainty, the sense of jealousy. 
these are we call these are the attributes of the mind origin and these are the attributes which have very low frequency even to the extent that it can make our body mind diseased the heart's attitude are inclusiveness love compassion feeling for each other empathy and so on and the frequency of these attributes is very high to the extent that it can also heal us these attributes yeah recently i came across a report uh, there's a phenomenal amount of research is happening um, somewhere in california about this frequency thing and they figured out so they you know so we are a bioelectric field the whole system is a bioelectric field so they measured the electric field of the mind and the electric field of the heart and the results were astonishing the electric field of the heart is about 60 to 100 times much more powerful than the electric field of the mind it's a power center another thing they then also measured the magnetic component of it you know we are also magnetic beings they measured the magnetic field of the mind versus magnetic field of the heart and the results were amazing unbelievable because the magnetic field of the heart is about 5000 times more stronger than the magnetic field of the mind this is what they came up in in that research which surely means we have an extremely powerful center of our existence which we are probably either missing or as padmakar ji said that we are only using in the eye context and eye context is the mental context right so there's something to really investigate think about it you know i'm also reminded by reminded of you know let's say rumi and i read a very beautiful quote of rumi where he says there's a candle in your heart ready to be kindled there's a void in your soul ready to be filled do you feel it don't you he said there's a candle in your heart similarly if you read any of the stories of let's say krishnas and gopis and all of that they also always said that you know you stole our heart they never said you stole our mind there's a significance when you know realized being in their in their walk in their speech use the heart rumi does not say that there's a candle in your mind waiting to be kindled he's saying there's a candle in your heart waiting to be kindled there's a they're trying to give us some pointers that's all i'm saying yeah and similarly if let's say somebody says if I, if somebody says to me who are you i'll say i am anish right the hand goes towards the heart somewhere here the hand does not go here nature is trying to give us a signal that there's a powerful center your hand automatically goes there we do namaskar like this and not like this the hand automatically goes there there's something happening here we need to we need to be mindful of this you know what's how why it goes here and not here yeah just a i thought just a point i will share yeah okay moving on mm today i think on the on this amazing session we have some illuminaries amongst us some visionaries who've done amazing work towards this i would i would like to just invite any input any comment from i i think uh, dwarkanath ji is on the session if you want to if you, you want to make any comment any any you want to share your thought with us <laughs> yeah yes would you like to speak something on this dwarkanath ji or or i think we we have uh, alka mittal ji also amongst us yeah yes please dwarkanath ji please good morning and i am i have to say i have learned a lot today i have nothing you know have that sort of rich experience including you what you explained i made a note of it i am sure jp will give us the recording later yes. uh, i think the way you explained you know i always had the confu- confusion between the science and spirituality how they can go together i think this is my challenge you know i don't know whether i have left brain or a right brain or i have any brains at all or not because <laughs> i get confused when you talk about oneness fullness compassion especially the words were using and use the word 
resilience, which I keep talking about it, we have not used in the right context uh, so far for me. But today there was a lot of clarity from you when you talked about the oneness, feeling of oneness, and then the heart space, mind space, which is, uh, I think it's very important that people like you and the, uh, the distinguished panelists, Padmakar ji and uh, Asha ji, we need to spread this message. Even many of the conferences, symposiums we are talking about, we are talking about in a very materialistic way. Uh, I think, you know, um, Asha ji has very kindly said that the emotional uh, intelligence is not enough. We need to extend. Maybe it has something to do with the curriculum and the, the way people have been taught and considered for all these jobs, which is more an IQ level even rather than an EQ. I hardly see any with a social science background getting into the uh, into these fields like earlier. That's why I see why Padmakati is so enriched it with his backgrounds. So my well said, sir. Well said. My submission is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a just a, for me. I am a beginner. I, but today is a very great eye-opener for me. I heard these words, but I couldn't get the right meaning. This has been very simply elicited by, by you and very well uh, explained by others. So I'm very grateful. I just want to end up saying the, 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 the instance where you gave, where how a tonsils uh, can be uh, helped. Maybe this is something which we need to educate the uh, clinical and medical practitioners also. Don't really, because just get rid of it, it has got its own value. So this is my submission. I'm very grateful to GP for organizing this along with, with the foundation. Thank you. And it's Thank a great eye-opener for me. I'm Thank richly you. benefited. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you Dwarkanath Thank you. Um, you want to pick up anyone else? Uh, yes, I think Alka Mittalji is also, I heard in the beginning. Is she Alka ji, you are here? Ah, she is there, Dr. Alka Mittal. Uh, Alka ji, unmute. Karo. Uh, unmute. Kar yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I actually, as I said in the beginning, I would like to listen more. But when we are talking about uh, resilience and uh, we are in context of today, what I have seen is that uh, while we are trying to understand what the science tells us about the virus, about the scenario, how to deal with it, our heart tells us that we have to give all empathy to our colleagues, to uh, those who are dealing with it. And for that, how we balance it, how we try to understand, how we try to identify those who are to be dealt with total compassion. At times, we also need to be a little particular about the kind of results we need to give as an organization, but balancing it is the most challenging thing. And that is what is making us, you know, move towards making ourselves and all others around us a little more resilient, because that is finally what is going to see us through this situation. So when I, I was just listening to you, uh, I was seeing that there's so much of depth in uh, each uh, word that all three of you have uh, spoken or you have shared. So I would like to absorb everything. And okay. uh, <laughs> I, I'm like on recharge mode. So I'm charging myself for the coming week. So thank you so much for giving me. Thank you. So nice. Correct. So very quickly, there are a few more things I want to touch upon before we move to the questions. You know, all of us into this world, into business, because of our training and our social structures and all of it, we, when we receive a higher knowledge, it gets kind of, it goes to our system, to our cellular level, but it takes a lot of time for it to start to decode within the system. But because of the way we are, we also need quick fix, you know, we also need, all right, that is all good, but what can be done practically? Yeah. So I thought I'll just share a very few simple things because I quickly browse through the through the comments also. Um, we need to know, you know, how to recharge the heart. As I said earlier, all our education uh, has been focusing on the mind aspect a lot. Yeah. What is it that we need to do to now strengthen, nourish the heart center of our system of this beautiful human system? Few very practical things I want to share. First is the creativity. Asha ji also talked about that, you know, one part of the brain has not been nurtured much. 
the creative aspects now what does creativity do to our being is okay we could do it creativity in two ways most of us do creativity with the end result okay i make a painting will it be sold will people uh, appreciate it and so on so on because of the end result we attach to our creative pursuit most of us do not initiate the creative process and that is what the heart that's like nutrition for the heart being yeah so we all need to include and something creative in our daily practice daily life it could be art it could be music it could be painting dancing writing anything that you feel is creative so that's one recommendation i will share with you as to do the other is be with as much as be as much as with the nature as possible there's a science there's a secret here you see we're all made up of five basic elements we all know that i'll not go into the details of this how do these five elements in the human system gets recharged alka ji talked about recharging these five elements in the human systems get recharged when i am with the five elements with nature with the water flowing with the birds with the trees with touching the earth walking barefoot lying under the sky in under the sun and just absorbing the space all around me it nurtures the heart center in ways we can't even imagine we've just been missing some of these basic points we've just been in our you know cocoons so to say think about this huh? just a humble recommendation the other thing which are education alka ji also said that you know a lot of and, and padmakar ji also touched upon this lot of damage has been done by the education system because the modern education focuses only on the head space we have two more things which we need to work with is the hands and the heart yeah the true holistic education is one which integrates these three elements educating the or training the head training the hands training the heart which then means we have to do every day something with our hearts oh sorry with our hands and these days we are only using hands for typing or you know on the phone hands are made to do to build things do carpentry you know fix your electric things in your own home you know do some something you know do do gardening touch the soil you know pick up things move your furniture something but hands must be used a lot because hands are connected to the heart space i'll not go into the detail of that we'll need another session for this but hands have a great role in nurturing the heart okay the the fourth thing is we must start to do things that we really enjoy and we have to take time out for that we all have things that we really enjoy but because those things unfortunately do not have any any let's say material value or an outcome and value we kind of in our to do list that comes at the end i love to listen to gazals but during my day when i create my to do list that is at the end if i get the time i will do that sorry don't do that bring it on the top because that will declutter the mind to be able to bring a certain focus into your day and open the heart more and last on this unfortunately we as a species we've become human doing instead of human beings we are in the mode of doing all the time during the day we do not give ourselves even 20 minutes to be human beings where you are just a being in a silent space you are just being by your own self you give yourself that time and space to just be by your own self at that time you're not doing anything and that is the magical space which starts to really open the heart and recharge you from from physical to mental to emotional to psychological to spiritual all layers of our existence starts to get recharged in the spiritual context we call it meditation but most of us for us meditation is also becomes doing that we start to do meditation it takes the shape of doing think about this recommendation it's time that we start to bring some beingness into our daily life to be able to develop the real resilience which then is never dependent on the outside scenario yeah there is an advanced practice also but for the lack of time we'll not go into that on these 
these five points that I just shared, which we can bring into our daily life to enrich our heart center, our beingness more, to build the real resilience. I would like to invite any comments, any thoughts by Padmakarji or Asha ji on this. Padmakarji, would you like to say something on this? Since you're an artist, I know you paint <laughs> and photograph. <laughs> uh, no, but I think I, I fully support this because uh, as a painter, many a time, you know, because having been trained in the way you are, uh, for a long time, uh, at a point in time, I got stuck with this concept, which is thought-based, that I am a painter, I am an artist. And so at that point in time, when I, I, I just couldn't flow in terms of my painting because then comes the other issue of measurement and calibration. Will others appreciate it? Uh, you know, will it be acceptable in a so-and-so place and so on? And nothing worked. Then I had to, I thought it was a mental block, it was an artistic block, like the writer's block, but then I understood that this is not what it is. But the moment I threw this garbage out of my head, I had to do, do a lot of processing internally. Why am I painting? For what purpose? Is it for myself or to relax me and to let me flow? Uh, all the unstated things. Then, then I realized that the appreciation of others, that time, that point in time, mind you, no galleries were also willing to look at what I was painting. They said, this is not the kind of stuff we will hang in the exhibit. I, I think then, something like that happened with Picasso also, no? if I'm not wrong. And I'm no, I don't really know. Okay. Then I had a dialogue with my wife and then even she was concerned. Why are you not painting? I said, look, I'm going to this extreme agony and then she also finally put the final nail in the coffin by saying you you know very well for what you're painting for yourself so so damn it let others say what they want to say you do what you have to do and mind you then i started flowing many things happened my canvas size increased from a very small to big and and I stopped caring whether any gallerist will approach me or not and then they started approaching on their own when I gave up. So there seem to be some universal paradox of some kind of there. When I'm chasing something, that goal seems to shift and then run away. It seems to agonize me. And the chasing is happening from the head. But when I'm operating from the heart, some way the chasing is happening from outsiders coming inside here. So this is one of the things which we also try to tell people. In fact, when people come to me in terms of work satisfaction, dissatisfaction, they're not getting career progressions. So one of the things I try to tell them, I say, look, it's, you may say it's easy coming from the chairman of the company or a director, HR, don't look for progressions because you have reached there. But I said, look, at no point in time did I worry about these things for myself, which may sound strange to you, but that is true. So. Some of the things which uh, our Bhagavad Gita says in terms of Nishkama Karma and some of those things do play out when you are really committed uh, at the heart level and only then your intelligence starts flowing out and then you are doing it for the happiness of it, for the quality of it, for the standards that you're creating for yourself and without being smug about it, mind you, without letting it go to your head and staying humble. Then the work seems to be noticed by many others and some of them are drawn to you. Probably the magnetic field that you described, which is much larger at the heart than the head level, maybe that is what attracts the people when you really flow. Yeah. So I think many things happen the moment you start connecting here at the workplace also, many things flow. Because you're not objecting, you're not being critical, you're not cutting down people down to size, which happens from the head level completely. At the moment you say, can you come and join me? I have a problem. Can you help me? Those kind of things, then everyone seems to join and things seem to happen so beautifully. Beautiful. Now we know the secret of your, your profound wisdom and the depth which I felt when we, we had few conversations. Now I know the secret of that, Padmakar. Huh? The, the, so you paint for the ananda of it, you know, the act in itself is the act of ananda. There is no ananda, which is bliss, which you will find at the end of it. 
द प्रोसेस इज द आनंद Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So, just a quick one on this, Padmakar ji. People like you are called enlightened beings, by the way. Okay, I just thought I should make that point. <laughs> Alka ji, would you like to? No, sorry. Uh, Asha ji, would you like to uh, share some thought on this? Um, yeah, I want to say the mind divine. the heart unites yeah the mind atomizes the heart is holistic the mind criticizes the heart accepts and uh, socrates made a great statement that many thousand years ago still relevant for us today be kind because everyone is fighting a battle so what is it that you know an organization should do was something which has always been bothering me regarding uh, uh, you know creating the resilience i think organizations pretend that there are no emo- emotions in mm. men and organizations should acknowledge that in this time people are feeling insecure people are feeling vulnerable people have ha- are experiencing trauma can we acknowledge that can we provide safe spaces for people to express it and can we also as organizations in our own ways fi- give support to people listening is a great support and whatever little help we can do is a great support so that is what organizations can do and i believe that today it is the time for businesses to think more on sustainability rather than pushing only on competitiveness because we have to first of all sustain and if we push people too much we are going to break them and we are going to lose them in terms of their engagement with the organization and at the individual level i would like to say just be and when we say just be it means you don't have to do anything just let it be there and then you have the flow of consciousness which is there within you but which is never getting a chance to explore uh, come to the surface because the mind is continuously chattering non stop so another way of looking at meditation is just silencing this mind there may be a religious connotation to it there may be a spiritual connotation to it whatever it is that works for you but try to get into a zone where you can still your mind and i think that is where the right brain the heart compassion love everything will come forth come forth to the mind to your consciousness because ultimately we are all holistic human beings we are only ignoring parts of our psyche so i'll stop there thank you beautifully said beautifully said aisha ji beautifully said thank you very much um looking at the time gp i think uh, we will overshoot if we yeah <laughs> yeah so should we should we have 10 more minutes of uh, question answer instead of yeah hmm. lots of comments so i am not raising the comments we will record all the comments we have a recorded session of this session but then we would request participants please put your mail id in the chat box okay Uh, instead of writing to us you just write so that it's our job to send it to you otherwise uh, you have to write to us one more botheration write your mail id here itself okay with that i will take one or two interesting questions uh, uh this is a question from paramji uh he says both the emotion and logic is experienced by brain or mind as we say how do you experience both beyond this mind what do we do to reach that he says how do we go beyond the mind hmm. so so if you see param ji that uh, in the last leg of the dialogue earlier i kind of touched upon this that so okay look at it from two dimensions there are certain attributes we associate with the mind the attributes of fear anxiety pain grief jealousy which we experience a lot and so on so these are the attributes of the mind and then we said the attributes of heart are love compassion openness embracing every everybody yeah having said that now the 
how do we go beyond the only mental space is the five sutras that i shared if i start to implement those five sutras in my everyday life param ji suddenly you will start to see that the consciousness has started emerging in such a way that now the mind starts to come to your control now it's you who starts to control the mind with the power of the heart let me re- let me repeat this this is important then it will be you who will start to control the mind with the power of heart and a great leap of jump starts to happen from the beyond the mind space and reality starts to open up reality starts to feel in ways which we've never imagined yeah so i would suggest practice this just do these five things and see what the results are in next 3 to 4 months yeah and then see the real deep resilience be in it uh from dr pushpa sethi uh, she is from gurgaon she says scientific education makes us practical materialistic and evidence based in our approach how to handle various situations so how does one integrate spirituality with this so they appear to be antagonistic <laughs> yeah so as i said uh, earlier in the conversation that so far unfortunately our belief system has been or our thought has been that science is proof based huh? in the hindi the word is very beautiful praman based we thought spirituality is belief based so they tell you there is a god sitting up there you believe in that huh? don't ask for any proof it doesn't work like that we are all educated people the real spirituality is also praman based proof based but the point is you will not be able to see the proof outside but you will be able to feel the proof out inside number 1 number 2 you will start to see your the proofs will start to come as manif- as 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 feedback from people around you our relationship starts to become very beautiful evolved your stability you will start to feel in the middle of all the storms there is something which is always stable in you these are the proofs which you will know within you will not have to believe believe in any scripture or any dogma you yourself will experience these proofs so in that sense i would say science and spirituality are not two separate things both are based on pramana in fact in our in our traditional advaita vedanta the whole thing is based on pramana if you can't pramanate if you can't feel the proof of it no the proof of it there is no spirituality happening then it's intellectualization which is happening so let's say if i say i'm a very stable being i have deep resilience i have love and compassion for the whole humanity i'm saying this right now there's a dog outside crying or or fell in a pit what is it i'm going to do or right now i'm seeing there's a mass scale suffering all around me what am i going to do am i only going to be fearful about the virus and protect my immediate family of 3 4 people or through whatever means i have i'm going to extend an hand and show see these are the pramana these are the proof that love compassion and oneness is just not an intellectual thought that you have it has gone deep down in your system and you experience it and you operate from that experience so the center of your operation shifts from the mental intellect to the soil of your heart which is based on deep love and compassion and oneness this is the pramana this is the proof uh next one uh, i'll also get padmakar into it it's an interesting comment by a very very senior uh, professional in the audience the mr nagras he says what we are discussing here like integrating spirituality and science resilience how do you make the majority who live in the villages rural population how do they understand integrating spirituality science what is resilience uh some some clarification okay very quickly on that four years ago after emerging from deep sadhana of over a decade when there was a message to now open up and speak and be with the world a friend asked just like that a friend asked what is can you explain in one word what you feel now what difference has made what has happened in 10 years of sadhana can you just give me in one sentence without even thinking the sentence or the word which came from my mouth is jagat kalyanam yeah jagat kalyanam which is 
this life is now dedicated for the good of the whole world of this universe of this cosmos it can have multiple expressions and manifestation right depending on your own uh, how, how do i say your own inner strength your own inner capability right so somebody could become a teacher somebody could become a writer somebody would just become a worker on the ground and he will go from village to village teaching this but the whole thing starts how does the fire forest fire starts the forest fire starts from one chingari one spark in my own experience the moment this spark happens in you as an individual the spark becomes a raging fire and the fire then finds its own expression you don't even have to choose the expression the path starts to unfold itself this is in my experience i don't know if i have answered it or no <laughs> next one is from pradhya uh, attention follows intention so where does intention arise <laughs> it from spirit or soul or a deeper consciousness <laughs> pradna lovely to hear this from you after many many years pradna okay i talked about that our existence is two layers largely although there are more but for the simplicity sake is the mind space and the heart space mind space is largely the space of fear heart is largely the space of inclusiveness right whichever space pradna is more activated in you in your daily life activities when you're dealing with your house self when you're dealing with your family when you're dealing with your friends when you're dealing with your employees when you're dealing with your chauffeur all of it in each of these small experiences if you see yourself operating more from the heart space rather than the head space then all the intentions will come from the same root see we are not two beings we are not two different people the moment this shift starts to happen from this space to this space the intention will start to come from here that's the example i quote when i experienced that immense shift in me the first word that i uttered was jagat kalyanam good for the whole universe right where is this intention coming from it can't come from the mind space because mind only thinks for i me and myself yeah i hope i've answered that pradhya last but one navin kumar he says i had different levels of consciousness and collective consciousness what is the difference what does it really mean Okay. Different. Yeah. Okay. Naveen, it is a vast subject to be able to be able to answer in one minute. <laughs> yeah. Our sages spent, you know, lives and lives, you know, decoding this. But just to quickly point on that, we do not have many layers of consciousness. We largely have a consciousness dwelling in you, which you can find out if you are operating from the more mind space. Your consciousness is. bit vibrating at a lower frequency the moment the jagat kalyana field starts to enter into your system because that's how nature operates that is not your individual intention anymore it becomes part of the collective intention is that your consciousness is shifted the vibration of your consciousness becoming higher now when when that starts to happen there is a there is a seamless connect that you start to have with the collective consciousness which means you actually start to feel the joy of the world around you and the pain of the world around you because that collective starts to speak to the individual it is much more mystical and uh, occultish than this but i will not speak more than this on on this forum <laughs> yes please asha yes please. because collective consciousness was the term which i used and i want Ji. in which context i used the term um for example when you see the migrant crisis especially when it happened last year we all felt the pain why did we feel the pain we are all connected mm. that connection that is that intangible spiritual <clears throat> of, uh, consciousness connection okay when as a community as a society we suffer something that's an evidence of uh, collective consciousness or as uh, anish ji mentioned it is your internal praman you get the proof that you are all internally connected right so that okay. is consciousness and one more point individual level consciousness we operate i mean if you reflect on yourself throughout the day early morning you may start with great uh, you know highest level of uh, operation of your consciousness and uh, you know you say all the good things you have all the great intentions and all that then you get into the hurly burly of the day you're operating at a different level of consciousness and then in the evening when you're relaxing you're operating at a different level of consciousness so it's a very simple indicator of how consciousness vary <laughs> okay. in the whole day <laughs> and beautiful <laughs> wonderful uh, padmakar padmakar there is a question from yashwant 
one of yes. our young dynamic uh, guy from Gale. During this deadly wave of pandemic, how can leaders build organizational resilience despite the challenges? Uh, any thoughts? I think one of the, uh, see, if I have to look at resilience as a subject, uh, it is generally the contra to that is victimhood. So resilience has a lot of hope in it. And anything which is resilient, which is to bounce back, means that there has to be a lot of meaning that this too will happen, but at the same time, you cannot ignore it, but at the same time, you need to really strengthen yourself in different ways, which may be emotionally, physically, many other things. So this is what organizations need to do, that, look, these things are happening. There is a massive disturbance of some kind. It is not likely to go away. You can't wish it away. So take all due care for yourself and all your loved ones and so that. But at the same time, work also has to go on because you're, it's a world of becoming also because you, you are performing so and so role. You need your livelihood, many other things. So, but at the same time, the main thing is in terms of making them get rooted, giving them all the emotional support, uh, giving them a lot of hope in the midst of many of these disasters that they see and probably some bit of trauma counseling because everyone is losing multiple number of uh, those who are people who are very, very dear to them. So it's a whole host of activities which comes through a lot of caring, a lot of empathy, not sympathy, but a lot of empathy has to be uh, practically shown over there and giving them hand-holding in terms of passing through this crisis, but at the same time, giving them the responsibility to manage it also by themselves. Because suddenly we can't become an agony aunt and take over every problem of this. But we need to say that, look, we are there for you. But at the same time, you also need to grow through this and come out stronger, mature. That is what to me is received. Thank you. Thank you. Anish, uh, last question from Jyoti. Please explain more about heart and mind functionality. <laughs> GPC, you are asking such uh, expanded questions. Uh, and then after the session, <laughs> then after the session, you will say that, you know, I overshot. <laughs> okay, Jyoti, um, you know, okay, I might not be able to go into the absolute depths of it. But just to touch upon this, when we see the functionality of the mind and the heart, mostly we understand it from a biological perspective, that the mind actually in the biology term, there is nothing called mind. There is only brain. And then brain has specific function and neurons and whole lot of things. If you ask a biologist, what is mind and where is mind, he or she will not be probably be able to answer because mind is not a physical organ. Brain is a physical organ. Similarly, heart is a physical organ one side of your chest. The medical, the biological, the organal heart. But in this context, when we are talking about heart, we are talking about heart center. Notice, most of the time when I have used the term heart, I am calling heart center. It is not the heart as an organ which has a role to pump the you know uh, blood and so on. It's, an, it's a center of your being. And just a key or just a pointer towards that. When you say I, next time if you point towards yourself and say I, just observe where is the fingers pointing towards. It is which side of your chest, where the organ of the heart is or the center of your chest. So the spiritual heart center is in the center of your chest where the rib cage meets. That's the center. And that is the center of real resilience. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't go beyond this in this. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we have to take a bonus question because it's a very interesting question. Amitabh Jha is asking three of you, uh, what energizes you? Each one has to tell one. <laughs> okay. I would give this uh, first to be answered by Asha Ji. <laughs> it's love. Love. Okay. Padvakar? The very same thing. Okay. Yeah. Anish? Um, I already actually mentioned about it, this whole sense which entered into me, I don't know from where, but the Jagat Kalyanam. So every breath is 
towards that that energizes me thank you is the dr raina here from jk university he raised his hand okay um, dr raina not there so what no, i'm doing i'm i'm, I'm very yeah. much there uh, ah yeah. sir uh, what is your question what is your question? no i didn't have any question okay then it i right. just was engrossed in the deep higher level okay. discussion i'm enjoying okay. every bit of it. okay thank you sir thank you uh, so uh, keeping in view the paucity of time what i will do is i am supposed to sum up and conclude no, no i am not going to do that i will request each one of you write one learning one take away in the chat box i will consult it and then circulate that's better please write in the chat box what is one learning one take away one thought that you are going to go there use it for ourselves share it with the community do something good uh, what inspired you in the chat box please please write each one of you should write um, uh, somebody has already written doing and being wonderful uh, nurture heart more than mind help the needy wonderful practice nourishing love care warmth keep working on it amita wonderful. wonderful that's good okay very nice very nice so while we this is happening we may take 5 10 seconds i requested uh, sri anish uh, to share us with us one last quote in the form of a slide okay so we'll show that slide and that's the end of the session uh, and anish will explain and talk about it and then say something while we are writing this okay okay, okay. Uh, gp would you allow me to instead of uh, explaining on this quote because it's kind of self explanatory i really want to uh share a sincere heartfelt thanks can i speak on that yeah so in in that gp you know my foremost thanks to you for nudging me and guiding me and inspiring me to do this event because you know i've been i'm a little shy person <laughs> but i'm just amazed gp by your not just the not just the attention to de- detail but your ability to connect with the world and the authentic compassionate self that you are because without that things like these events like these are not possible so my first pranam to you gp for for who you are yeah and then my second pranam to these two wonderful friends i have made and i have found on the way to to create this event uh, padmakar ji and asha such a deep profound phenomenal beings both of them and i am truly blessed to be able to know you and i know that this friendship and sharing the wisdom and learning the learning from both of you is going to enrich me for the rest of my life and this is a relationship which i think will continue for for decades to come till the time i'm here so thanks very much for giving me this honor to be able to have this conversation with you padmakar ji and asha thank you very much my dear friend I am not finished with Marker yet. <laughs> Allow me one more minute, with Marker. Just one more. Minute. And a special friend, and a special thank to this special friend called Pankaj Bansal. You know, we went to college together. We were in in our MBA together. He's been a batch senior to me. We created people strong initial days. We were together writing the business plan and a lot of that. Pankaj has been a true support always. by my side whenever i need him and in in sessions like these he's a real moral support always pushing nudging and caring and guiding me in the process so thank you pankaj for who you are and my big thanks to all of you because this is important because i or padmakar ji or asha ji as a speaker we just cannot do anything unless there is a collective energy poured by the constant attention from each one of you it's been a collective session it is not one person is sharing the gyan or teaching with the rest no no it's a it's a two way process the energy gets poured from your side as as the listener and the energy gets poured from this side as a as a speaker and the magic or the depth gets created so thanks to each one of you who's logged in i'm extremely sorry for the initial time when a lot of you could not log in because of the tech glitch Uh, i'm sure in future that will not be the case and lastly but not the least the the support team of the beloved friends and volunteers at sadhu who who've tirelessly worked with me with padmakar ji with asha with gp to 
to put this together and uh, and the tech support it thank you very much all of you yes padma cuz you now <laughs> i'm relieved i there's no you know <laughs> i i won't take much time at all but uh, thank you very much uh, anish uh, gp as well as asha ji um, it was wonderful uh, it's not very easy to handle topics of this nature and the elan with which uh, gp sir uh, has really connected up with so many people and when i heard the profile of some of the um, people in the audience it's a little daunting to speak in front of them uh, <laughs> yeah dr tv rao was there <laughs> yeah yeah my very senior people very profoundly deep people but all the same uh, we really had to think through i had to really stay centered and then focus completely in terms of where things are and these kind of subjects there can be no preparation at all it depends on what really emerges at this point in time so thank you very much anish you, for facilitating thank you thank that you so much and oh. uh, making us speak well okay so if i have responded more deeply it's also because of the way thank the you. session oh, has flew yeah. thank you so much thank and you so much my so, mind it has worked thank you what now i propose is I will oh, request. May I say thank you? Yeah, yeah, you are, <laughs> you are hope. You are the hope for all of us, Asha. Yes, I have to demand my right even to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, all of you. Thank you very much. You've thank been you. amazing. In a Asha. great session.